How the LGBTQ agenda is forced on us. Have you heard the phrase, the apple of discord? I'll tell you where it originated. It's a strangely illuminating story. Have fun recalling the tale of Sleeping Beauty and her fairy godmothers because it parallels some elements of this story. In chapter 24 of the Iliad, Homer describes the origins of the Trojan War. It turns out that Eris, the goddess of discord, was not invited by Zeus to the elegant wedding of Achilles' parents, Precisely because being the goddess of discord, the one who always brought the vision, she would have ruined the party for everyone. In revenge for such an offense, Eris turned up uninvited to spoil the feast in another way. With a prize. A golden apple from the Garden of the Hesperides, no less. The apple would be a trophy for beauty. A beauty award, which is why it had the inscription Te Calista, the prettiest, the most beautiful of all, and only one of the girls present could win it. The wedding was going very well and according to plan, but as soon as a prize for beauty appeared, discord began, and everything went downhill. Imagine three goddesses as distinguished as Aphrodite, the goddess of erotic love, Athena, the goddess of war and wisdom, and Hera, the goddess of marriage and family, wife of Zeus, the queen of Mount Olympus. These three supernatural beings, ipso facto raised from their comfortable couches, demanding that Zeus give them the prize, because they are convinced each of them that they are without a doubt the most beautiful woman present. Zeus sees the danger of favoring one of them over the other two, and, being the cheating, lecherous, slippery Zeus that he always was, decides, Hey guys, why don't we let uh, someone else make this decision? Look, uh, how about uh, letting Paris, the prince of Troy, decide? The three goddesses are so eager to proclaim themselves the winners of this impromptu beauty pageant that, abandoning their decorum, their majesty, their self-esteem, they submit to the most unnecessary degradation, humiliation of themselves. Three goddesses, three supernatural portents with supernatural power and beauty, the divas of wisdom, war, erotic love, marriage, and the family, run like overexcited teenagers to bathe and preen themselves, and then strip naked before the lustful gaze of a mere mortal with no merit or grace, for him to inspect them at his pleasure from all angles to see how divine they are? I insist, a mere mortal inspecting three supernatural creatures who have become as heedless as the most fickle and immature girl to win the prize and be declared Te Calista, the most beautiful, the prettiest girl at the party. That's how powerful the promise of a prize is. All the dignity, wisdom, and even the sacred nature of three rapture-inducing goddesses disappears when there is a beauty prize to be won. Three divinely beautiful and powerful women allow themselves to be dragged and humiliated into an embarrassing beauty contest in which they are already losers from the first moment, because in the end, really, all three of them lose because they stooped down like that. And then, of course, they provoke a war, the Trojan War. Isn't it incredible when you start to think about it? All this is what the apple of this gourd leaves in its wake. It is ridiculous, but also chilling, 
to think this is how easy it was to manipulate three vain goddesses to strip naked and parade themselves before a mortal's eyes. And this is precisely how LGBTQ ideology is imposed on all of us. Yes, LGBTQ groups deceive us all like the three goddesses by organizing beauty contests so that we abandon all respect for reason and for ourselves in the illusion of being declared the most beautiful, the most open, the most virtuous, the most egalitarian and inclusive. We are the goddesses undressing and disgracing ourselves before the lusty gaze of a mere mortal to win a perfectly stupid and useless little prize. Bravo. I will be telling you here about the specific case of a militant group called Stonewall, and we'll talk about its infiltration at all levels of life in Britain. I'm sure that something similar is happening in your country, too. Stonewall is the largest LGBT rights organization in Europe. Stonewall is a pressure group that has used multiple bullying tactics over the decades and which boasts much about having achieved victories against the prejudice of us all, such as the legalization of gay marriage, the Pride March, the granting to gay couples of the same rights and tax breaks that heterosexual couples with children receive. Although, of course, our contribution to society is far more valuable and crucial. Stonewall is the kind of group that invades churches as a publicity stunt and loudly, threateningly disrupts religious services. The group that feels it is morally superior to any religious person because the intimidating screamers recruited by Stonewall have no prejudices, whereas those of us who practice a religion are full of them, of course. Stonewall feels it is legitimate to publicly expose to scorn and destruction any politician or bishop or leader who does not fold his hands and follow their instructions and plans that employs devious and underhanded tactics to discredit hundreds of educators, psychologists, politicians, or doctors who do not dance to their tune, that infiltrates the family lives of leaders, MPs, teachers, or businessmen to find some skeleton in the closet with which to persuade them to collaborate with their ends. In short, a review of Stonewall's history, check it out in Google, reveals many incidents that do not make it appear as a champion of transparency, equality, inclusiveness, civic merit, or even basic goodwill. Stonewall, for example, is behind initiatives such as the removal of the words woman and mother from the laws in Ireland and Scotland that we discussed in the previous episode of this podcast, entitled The Disappearance of Women. Check it out. That's the kind of initiative that Stonewall promotes and applauds. Stonewall is the sort of organization that justifies any underhand tactic claiming that all is fair in war. But war, and Stonewall's eminently warlike mentality, leaves us all maimed and reduced in the end. If not dead. We are all cannon fodder or collateral damage in Stonewall's war on the road to victory. Because to a narcissist, and the entire LGBTQ movement is the most egregious embodiment of narcissism on a societal level, no one else exists or deserves to be heard or respected but them. To the narcissist, you and I and our children, institutions, societies, our jobs, are just the stepping stones they can trample on to move further along the path of living out their fantasy. Stonewall has destroyed thousands of lives and families and careers because it suited their advancement and will continue to do so with impunity unless we all wake up. Stonewall will never be satisfied because the day their ideological and political warfare ceases, Stonewall will cease to have a purpose. And so, it plants the apple of discord and war, even when there is no discord.
The tactic is amazingly simple. Stonewall will tell you that to be a good person, to be a good company, you have to recognize the transgender minority as a victim, and you have to remedy their situation. How? Stonewall tells you how. By joining Stonewall Diversity Champions, Stonewall's League of Champions of Justice and Goodness, at the pageant to decide who is the Calista, the prettiest girl at the party. According to Stonewall criteria, of course. Stonewall puts you on the board of his League of Champions and gives you the instructions to move up in the tournament, earning points every time you impose on your employees the practices and criteria that Stonewall dictates to you. And like those three Greek goddesses, you will undress before Stonewall's inquisitive gaze so that Stonewall can decide which parts of you to trim or shave because they don't seem too pleasing to them. But the process doesn't end there. You must pay money to Stonewall to check you from head to toe, like Paris ogling the three vain goddesses, and to help you train your employees by paying for seminars and equality courses. Fabulous plan. As a political group, they sell you the idea that you must solve a grave injustice that you did not cause. And even if it exists, it is not up to you to solve it. And then, as a charitable educational institution, they charge you for training you to implement their ideology. Very good. Unbelievable that so many companies, universities, and governments submit to this indignity, to this self-humiliation and self-contempt, as did the foolish goddesses Athena, Hera, and Aphrodite, to win the apple to the prettiest girl at the party. Let me explain further. Political groups like Stonewall magnify to ridiculous scale the presence and weight of a micro-minority of the population. And why do I call them a micro-minority? I ask you, how many trans men or women do you know personally? How many trans men or women figure in your daily life? I promise that even in Britain and the U.S., the answer for 99% of us is none. That is a micro-minority. So micro that you never come across it. But Stonewall wants you to organize your work, your life, your children's education around the whimsical predilections of this micro-minority that does not even figure in your life. And if you object... You are branded and trolled as transphobic, a cruel and dreadful backward person. They scream and rage from a strategic position as victims, abusing the natural goodwill of all of us to come to the rescue of any victim. Instinctively, we are all Don Quixote, and we live to save maidens and undo wrongs and try to be the saviors of the world. And once they catch us responding like this, they come close and say, Would you like to know how to put an end to this terrible injustice? Yes? Well, we will tell you how, because we are the experts on the subject. Who else could tell you better? Buy our equality and inclusion courses for your company, your organization, and your government department, and we will soon turn you into the bell of the ball. So the same lobby group, the same political pressure group that raised the first accusation of discrimination now doubles up as a charitable education company. It wins first the political victory of being seen as a victim and convincing you of their plight. And now it charges you for educating you and your employees doubling up as an educational charity to meet its political and social agenda. It's just a bit... <clears throat> Reminds me of the strategy of the polysphincta wasps, which plant an egg in the body of a spider. 
The wasp larvae hatch and attach themselves to the spider's abdomen, where they slowly feed on the spider's fluids while the spider goes about its daily life. At some point, however, the larvae modify the spider's behavior by controlling its mind, inducing it to spin a cocoon that the wasps will use to pupate and develop into adults. Any semblance to reality is purely coincidental. Good people, government departments, and thousands of businesses that do not want to discriminate against anyone sign up in all good faith to a program to transform their world in such a way that it pleases this offended micro-minority. And then companies, universities, and government offices start to follow their directives on how to choose employees, how to educate employees, how to reward or punish employees, and how to turn left or right according to the interests of the perennially offended micro-minority. Moreover, they have created a League of Champions, a beauty contest, to stimulate and reward the most fervent converts those who want to end so many injustices committed all the time, according to reports from the micro-minority. From then on, they give you points every time you obey a new instruction or directive because that's the only way to move up in the ranking of the best companies in the fight against injustice and discrimination or some such invention. And the employees of those companies and those governments and surely among them also some LGBTQ people, who therefore have a personal political agenda to push, are assigned or assign themselves the role of equality ambassadors in their environments. That sounds terrific. Equality ambassadors. To denounce all their colleagues and bosses who might question the ideas promoted by Stonewall. The employees who sustained hard work has brought the company to its prominence today are silenced. At the same time, the ideology of the political organization that doubles up as a charity is promoted until it becomes corporate, institutional, or even government policy. As with Homer's three goddesses, the delusion of wanting to be the prettiest girl only breeds discord. In this way, political groups as fixated as Stonewall have gained enormous power and influence in our governments, schools, businesses, and universities. By exploiting the goodwill of all of us who spontaneously want to rush to the aid of a victim and stop anyone who might abuse them. Although groups like Stonewall very rarely show us any evidence of such discrimination, they only have to suggest its possibility. There are many attacks against us, they tell us. Where? When? Under what circumstances? Do you have any names, dates, details? We all fold our hands, ashamed to participate, however unknowingly and unwittingly, in abusing people as weak and marginalized as the victim group in question. <laughs> Let us not forget the onanistic gratification of social justice warriors, the orgasmic reward to the ego of anyone who feels better than the rest of us because they are fighting for justice and equality for oppressed minorities. Let's just remember that precisely that was the strategy of Nazism to seize power in Germany, of Bolshevism to do the same in Russia, and of course Chavism in Venezuela more recently. Denouncing the ideological errors and crimes of their neighbors and colleagues greatly gratifies the ego of the denouncer because in this way they feel that they are a positive force for change in their reprobate society, even if they are defending lies that will destroy their culture, family, and society. Social justice warriors don't seem to care as long as they get to be the Calista, the prettiest of them all today. Why do companies like the BBC demand that all their employees answer questions like what is your gender identity to have the right to be treated equally in the company's life? The inquisitors, sorry, I mean ambassadors, 
that Stonewall has planted or won over go about denouncing and punishing anyone who does not obey the rulings of the party. Sorry, <laughs> the charity. Until fear sets in and everyone folds their hands unquestioningly for fear of losing their jobs. It sounds like a dictatorship, doesn't it? Well, it is. It is a maneuver of oppression and intimidation even in our most private, intimate spaces. Like children in China and East Germany, educated to spy on and denounce their parents. Like informers in Cuba, Albania, or North Korea. Or like the cameras on every wall and the collaborators spying on every citizen in George Orwell's 1984. It is a repressive ideological dictatorship, and we all have lost the freedom to question it, because any questioning, even if perfectly justified and documented, is a crime of conscience. They seem to be behaving like a fundamentalist religion, like a Sharia court, like the Inquisition. People who have detransitioned describe today their transgender experience as something akin to being members of a cult or religious sect. Listen to their public debates and arguments and check how many minutes or seconds it will take for you to hear the terms prejudice, cruelty, and even suicide. They want to convince you that unless you affirm and support them in all their positions, which involve such simple things like the disappearance of women, the family, and utmost disregard for nature and biology, you are driving them to depression and suicide. You are actively causing the suicide of many dysphoric young people who can only survive if we offer them transgender surgery and hormones. Like the infamous Tavistock Clinic in London did time after time until the government finally shut it down. And why? Because it was discovered that they never bothered to consider all the circumstances affecting the mental health of their gender reassignment patients. Things such as autism, depression, or family violence in their rush to diagnose them with castration, mastectomy, and hormone treatments. As if autism, depression, or family violence could ever be solved with hormones and surgeries. In all the companies affiliated with the beauty contest, the Workplace Equality Index, that is, the Stonewall Virtue Index, and there seem to be more than 850 companies in the UK alone, those little bureaucrats and little bosses enthusiastic about changing the world for the better, those ambassadors of change, champions of diversity, become the snitches and little dictators of their environments. In their little minds, they gain in virtue and brownie points for revolutionary behavior. The better and more frequently they denounce their colleagues and thus serve the party. Excuse me, I meant to say the charity. If you visit the stonewall.org.uk website, I'll put the link in the notes, you will find this enthusiastic message there. Transform your workplace today. Since 2001, our Diversity Champions program has helped thousands of employers like you to unlock the full potential of their LGBTQ workforce. Tell me, employer, how big is your LGBTQ workforce? That is, how many LGBTQ employees do you have? One? Two? None? In which case... Why do you want to get into solving problems you don't even have? But let's go back to the Stonewall page. Join the Diversity Champions Program. In the workplace, everyone should feel safe, welcomed, and free to be ourselves. That is why we have worked with thousands of employers, both in the UK and overseas, over the last 20 plus years to give them the confidence and tools they need to become LGBTQ inclusive leaders. Join the Diversity Champions program today and transform your workplace culture into one that can attract, retain, and nurture the top LGBTQ employees. Entrepreneur, I ask you again, how many LGBTQ employees do you have? One, 
two. None. Do you want to transform your workplace culture into a culture capable of attracting, retaining, and promoting the best LGBTQ employees? Unless you're Amazon, Microsoft, or Walmart, i.e. companies with more than 10,000 employees, chances are you don't have a single trans or queer employee because, statistically, there is only one person with clinical sexual dysphoria for every 10,000 people. In that case, does this program apply to your company? And if it doesn't, why bring it to your company? Why solve problems you don't have? But let's go back one last time to the Stonewall page. Wherever you are in your path to inclusion, we have the solution for you. Find out how to attract, retain, and nurture the best LGBTQ talent. Notice how manipulative, how hypnotic Stonewall's language is when they say, wherever you are in your path to inclusion. Unless you stop to examine the meaning of this seemingly innocuous phrase, wherever you are on your path to inclusion, you are already committed to the idea that there is a path to inclusion that you are on and didn't even know it, and on which you are very short because you're on your path to inclusion. Subconsciously, the idea has already been implanted in your mind that you are on a path, i.e., that you must move, change, transform, because every path is to walk. You must move forward in the direction they are pointing you in, towards inclusion. Unless you read this with great care, you're already toast. Because now you're subconsciously programmed to move from wherever you are to where they are pointing you, towards inclusion. Even if you are the most beautiful, most generous, most positive company in your society, towards inclusion which is the path that includes them but excludes the rest of your staff because the rest of your team, 99% of your team, are not transgender nor queer. But from here on out, you will make their lives much more difficult because from here on out, your mind and feelings are pointing in the direction of inclusion, which only benefits 1 in 10,000 employees, while patently harming, complicating the lives of every one of the other 9,999 employees that make up your company. You have been subconsciously programmed to restructure your company, which up to this point was probably doing very well, for the benefit of one in every 10,000 of your employees, statistically speaking. Unless you are Jeff Bezos, Bill Gates, or Mark Zuckerman, you don't have 10,000 employees, so you don't even have to think about these injustices or problems that are not yours to solve. Show respect to your employees, those who keep your company running, by not imposing on them thoughtless restrictions and disciplines dictated by a micro-minority, like forcing your female workers to share the toilets with men who claim to be women because that's what pleases the micro-minority. But back to the issue of uh, those informers, sorry, Stonewall's diversity champions. Sadly and regrettably, they are everywhere. The thought police is everywhere. Following advice from Stonewall and other transgender groups, Twitter, YouTube, Facebook, Google, Instagram, and LinkedIn love to commission and pay informers thought police, to punish and even cancel the account of anyone who dares to criticize, to blaspheme, LGBTQ dogma. They hire whole teams of these thought police with an entrenched social and political agenda as judges of what may or may not be offensive to transgender people, and they give them the power and authority to silence anyone who criticizes their political gender ideology silencing voices that might illuminate the field with sound scientific biological arguments, for example. So, diversity champions, promoting diversity. Let's pick only those who are not diverse, 
only those who obey without complaint or even celebrate the official doctrine of the party. Sorry, the charity that endorses and brainwashes them. The League of Champions, i.e. the beauty contest organized by Stonewall, is called the Workplace Equality Index. And they have UK and global indexes. Check them out on their website. I leave their details in the notes. Stonewall describes this table of companies under their influence as the definitive benchmarking tool for employers to measure their progress on lesbian, gay, bisexual, and trans inclusion in the workplace. On the list of top 100 employers 2023 in the UK, for example, the link is in the notes, you'll find insurers, banks, accountancy firms, communications companies, electronics companies, supermarkets, construction companies, universities, charities, and even public bodies such as the National Health Service and the Kent Fire Brigade. These are all excited teenage girls competing to be the prettiest girl at Stonewall's party. In order to gain points with Stonewall, these companies, banks, universities, and public bodies will indoctrinate us to say and repeat what suits only LGBTQ ideology, not us or our businesses, families, or governments, and even charge us for educating us. Companies send their employees to Stonewall courses, which cost over £400, over $500 per person. See Stonewall's website in the notes. And there are multi-millions of pounds and dollars in this. For example, the NHS, the National Health Service in Britain, may have no money for new hospitals and no money for more decent salaries for its nurses. But it has created a whole new line of change managers who earn £70,000, $85,000 as starting salaries for implementing transgender directives in public hospitals. All this is paid for with your money and mine in the case of universities, charities and government departments, with our freedoms and rights in the case of private companies, broadcasters and social media platforms. How does Stonewall infiltrate companies and governments to push its ideas? By persuading them to compete to see who's the prettiest of them all. That's it. That's all. That's the strategy in a few words. But it's a lot. And it's critical. We take note. Stonewall and other LGBTQ groups worldwide abuse the natural goodness of all of us because we don't want to be insensitive or unfair to anyone for any reason. And they further exploit our sense of competition, our healthy yearning to do better every day and be even better than others at what we do, our dream of being the prettiest girl, the Calista. This drive is great when it pushes us to excel and discipline ourselves for study and progress, sport or the arts. But it is a most dangerous impulse when we receive the prize not for our excellence as professionals, for the best design, for example, the best project, the best marketing of a product, but for our supposed moral excellence. When the prize is given to us because we are the fairest, the most equitable, compassionate, generous, inclusive, caring. Oh. Because to be the winner of a prize in any of these moral categories is a heady prize, an orgasm for our vanity. Because it proclaims us, it announces us to the world as superior to mere mortals. It invests us with the aura that we are better and admirable above all others, that we are in the inner circle. We have manifested our true natures as angels and social heroes. 
We are the prettiest girl in the beauty contest. No one knowingly wants to do anyone any justice. We all have a healthy and beautiful impulse to come to the prompt aid of a victim. So all a radical group like Stonewall has to do is present itself as representing innocent victims. And we immediately suspend all use of reason without asking for evidence or proof. For Stonewall, it is an injustice and discrimination for us to use the term woman or mother. So we are expected to extend our compassion and better say menstruating person or person with a womb. Because Stonewall and LGBTQ ideology have decided that the term woman is cruel and discriminatory to trans men who are women who hate being women so much that they go into the labyrinth of trying to become men every day of the rest of their lives. And now we must change our language and whole lives to celebrate their decision. We end up insulting women who love to be women so as not to offend them, the women who would like to be men because they hate being women. We spend our lives apologizing, accused by them of discrimination and insensitivity because they find reasons for discrimination even when there are none. They invent grievances that are not grievances to move us to make changes that do not need to be made. They multiply the rules and limitations on all of us. They dictate the words we can use and restrict our freedom to act in a natural way and in spontaneity for fear of committing some new outrage or injustice. We must obey rules that make no sense, but only reinforce the ideological penetration of transgenderism and give it a power and influence it does not deserve because it is a micro minority. All changes imposed by decree are secretly resented. Eventually the pendulum will swing, as it did in Scotland, where Nicola Sturgeon stubbornly forced through transgender changes and initiatives for years, and now that Nicola is gone, Scotland is the most gender ideology and gender self-assignment adverse nation in the UK. Genuine compassion or goodwill towards employees should be applauded, but it should bless every employee, not just one or two. Pandering to the transgender micro-minority is as false, abusive, and counterproductive a gesture as it would be to dictate that, in order to be egalitarian and inclusive to a new Muslim employee, we all should stop eating ham and interrupt our day five times to kneel in the direction of Mecca. Far from being supportive of the new Muslim employee, this would be a stink bomb against him. Because far from welcoming him and treating him like a real colleague, everyone will resent his presence. And everyone will celebrate with relief the day he finally leaves. These changes, we must emphasize, are only indicators of the ideological infiltration of transgenderism into every organization or government. It is terrible news for everyone. Better to let the Muslim employee follow his diet and prayer routine alone because they are only necessary to him. Let the transgender employees follow their pronouns and whims without imposing them on all of us because they are only important to them. But Stonewall and trans groups seek to penetrate the lives and consciousness of all of us from kindergarten children to mature elders. The struggle of Stonewall and the trans groups is a political, ideological struggle to implant their influence and their dictates. They have not and will never promote change for the benefit of all because they only want special rights for a few. According to Malcolm Clark, president of the LGB Alliance, Lesbian, Gay, Bisexual Alliance, who split from Stonewall and is now its most vocal critic, by 2022, more than 850 companies were competing in the Virtue Index, the League of Champions, the beauty contest that Stonewall calls the Workplace Equality Index. 
companies and institutions in the index will have to do some soul-searching and cost analysis. Ask yourselves how many trans employees you have. One? Two? Three at the most? And because you abide by the ideology of these two or three individuals, you subject your thousands of other employees to complications that make no sense at all? Like even suggesting that women should tolerate men coming into their toilets because these men claim to be women? Showing equality and inclusiveness to one employee to the detriment of all others only causes everyone to celebrate the day this one employee leaves because the company gave so much attention to one employee while ignoring, imposing on everyone else. Ask yourselves how much the Equality and Inclusion program, which only benefits two or three employees at most, is costing you. And I'm assuming your company has thousands of employees. Can you really afford such luxuries? Do you have so much money to throw around like that? Why not use it then to benefit all your employees, not just one or two? Ideas like forcing every employee to declare their gender or sex as if these were great mysteries that we have been cunningly hiding from those around us to deceive them. Or to use personal pronouns for their social media profiles. He, him. She, her. They, them. Have you seen this on the profiles of so many people who are neither gay, bi, trans, nor queer? This is patently absurd and dictatorial. Why force or threaten everyone when only one employee or two find it necessary to choose and proclaim their pronoun to identify themselves not as a he or a she, but as a they, them, or their, because their gender is in constant fluidity. Let this one employee or two add as many pronouns to their names as they like if that seems so essential to them, but let the other employees continue living without absurd rules or policies like this. Above all, don't be surprised if you soon start receiving lawsuits from the rest of your employees, from the 99% of your employees whom you are upsetting and offending by following the dictates of transgenderism. Don't forget that you have discriminated against, you have punished and even fired perfectly innocent and worthy employees on your way to earning the title of being the prettiest girl at the party, by transgender standards, of course. All those good, honest employees you fired or punished for no reason other than transgender ideology will return soon to seek justice, and they will be right to do so. Beyond all arguments, we are witnessing the rollout of a program of ideological indoctrination aimed at overthrowing traditional values and completely reshaping society. And if transgenderism would ever have a better world to offer, that'd be great. But how could they ever offer anything better than what we already have and that we can still improve upon? Even if they hide behind words like tolerance and inclusion, those who seek to change the social landscape must never impose their personal opinions or choices on the rest of us. Remember that the three Greek goddesses lost all their dignity and self-respect when they agreed to submit to a sham beauty contest to win an irrelevant award. That's what anyone who strips naked to be inspected and approved by militant, fixated groups like Stonewall does. <laughs> Thank you for listening. My name is Gabriel Porras. I'm a philosopher, journalist, editor, and communicator. Visit radiantwhispers.com to hear more programs like this. Mm -hmm.